This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Are you driving your car or doing laundry right now? Podcasts go best when they're bundled with another activity, like Progressive home and auto policies. They're best when bundled too. Having these two policies together makes insurance easier and could help you save. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. Quote a home and car bundle today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. The NFL is here, and it's all about the sweet offers from DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. New customers can pocket $200 in bonus bets instantly when you bet just 5 bucks on any NFL game. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code FIELDGOAL to sign up. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. See dkng.co slash football for eligibility, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Hang up and listen, fans. People who are listening for the first time might hear a bad word or two. Hi, I'm Josh Levine, and this is Hang Up and Listen for the week of September 5th, 2023. On this week's show, we'll talk about week one of the college football season, which was great for Colorado and Deion Sanders, much less great for TCU, LSU, and Clemson. We'll also discuss how Maryland football coach Michael Loxley is grappling with his son's posthumous diagnosis of CTE. And finally, ESPN's Elizabeth Merrill will join us for a conversation about Nebraska women's volleyball, which filled Lincoln's Memorial Stadium with more than 92,000 fans last week. I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm the author of The Queen and the host of the podcast One Year. Our new season, One Year 1955, is out now. Also in D.C. is Stefan Fatsis. He's the author of the book's Word Freak, A Few Seconds of Panic, and Wild and Outside. And this weekend, he brought home some Scrabble hardware. Played in two tournaments, two one-day tournaments, seven games each. Finished first in one, second in the other, 10-3-1 record. So you're not retiring anymore. Got my, I'm not retiring from Scrabble anymore. <laughs> Felt good. Made a f- crazy play. A nine-letter, triple-triple. Nine-letter, triple-triple for 113 points. Through the word us, which was just sitting there, I played using two blanks, trustless, T-R-U-S-T-L-E-S-S. Is it like, is it like the Biles? Like when you do a new vault, are they going to name that play the fat sis now? They should. I mean, obviously crustless is also good by the way, because the blank (laughs) was a T. Yeah. Pretty good weekend. I was pretty psyched. I'm, I'm happy for you. Uh, With us from California, it's Joel Anderson. He is the host of Slow Burn Becoming Justice Thomas, among other fine podcasts. Hello, Joel. Hey, man. Congrats on the debut uh, episode of One Year. A big fan. Hope everybody checks it out. Uh, I don't have anything to sell anymore. I'm just here. So, Joel Anderson, glad to be here. Present. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about the uh, One Year episode on Cannon Street All-Stars, Little League team in our Afterball segment. And also, if you subscribe to the Hang Up feed, you should have seen that episode intrude on your usual hang up and listen uh, schedule, but hopefully it was a happy intrusion. Um, And we also have a bonus segment for Slate Plus members this week. And in that bonus segment, we're going to talk about the opening week of the U.S. Open, which was great for a bunch of Americans and not great if uh, you tend to wilt in hot weather, as many of us humans do. Um, To hear us talk about that, you need to be a Slate Plus member. You get bonus segments on this show, on Slow Burn, on One Year, um, you get uh, ad-free listening, you get unlimited reading on the Slate site, and you get to support us. Slate.com slash hangup plus. That's slate.com slash hangup plus. This weekend in Fort Worth, Texas, last year's national champion, ship participant, the TCU Horned Frogs took the field and had nowhere close to top billing. Colorado was the big story of the offseason, thanks to their new coach, Deion Sanders, and the fact that he brought in 86 new players. 86. Expectations were not super high. The Buffaloes were a three-touchdown underdog. 
But on Saturday afternoon, Colorado, Coach Prime, his quarterback son, Shador, and two-way phenom Travis Hunter, they pulled off the upset, beating TCU 45-42 to and instigating a series of Deion Sanders victory laps and recriminations that will probably end next millennium sometime. Here he is in the post-game press conference calling out, for some reason, ESPN's Ed Werder. What's up, boss? You believe now? You, you, hold on, hold on, hold on, oh no. Do you believe in that? Huh? Oh, no, no, no. I read through that bull junk you wrote. I read through that. I sifted through all that. Yeah. Oh, no. Come on. Do you believe? You don't believe. You just answered it. You don't believe. Next question. Joel Anderson, do you believe? Look, you know, um, (laughs) Dion is not going to pin me down like that. But I'll I'll say this. Let's just go back to this tweet from November 2nd, 2021. Uh, There's no reason why Dion isn't considered a plausible candidate, and this is a TCU, unless something else is at play here. He's been in the DFW, been a success at Jackson State. Now, consider, this is after one year, not two. He's perfect for the new NIL era, an avowed Christian. What am I missing? An avowed Christian. You got that one in right at the end. I'm just saying, if that matters. Right before the character limit expired. Yeah, right. If (laughs) if you're a Christian university and this is something you allegedly care about, um, that's something that can play a part in that. And so, look, I'm... I'm going to try not to engage with many people listening to this might consider to be hyperbole, uh, (laughs) but just listen right now, take notes, and let's revisit this circa 2030 when the next round of media rights deals expire, right, for these conferences. Colorado 45, TCU 42 might be one of the most consequential outcomes in the history of college football. Mm. And, and, and in a lot of ways, it was sort of an existential inflection point, I think, for both TCU and Colorado. For one, at Colorado, with Dion, proof of concept. They looked good. They looked cool. They had a lot of fun. He did what he said he was going to do, right? Like, no coach that had come up from the FCS and made a debut in the FBS and had been a 20-point underdog had ever won a game under those circumstances. It has literally never happened before. Colorado hadn't beaten a team as ranked as high as TCU since 2009. It had not beaten a top 20 team on the road in more than 20 years. I think that game gave Dion and Colorado life. And on the other hand, for TCU, I'm, we, can, we don't have to get into that because I don't think people actually care about TCU because they were a damn B-side the game after their national championship debacle, right? Like, at least people typically tune in to want to see the national championship participant. That's not what was going on. And I think that is the bigger problem for TCU is that you had all this success, this magical run. Everybody's rooting for you guys. And then you embarrass yourself in the national championship game. And then possibly in the second biggest game that I can remember in recent memory, you go out and you get embarrassed by a team that everybody expected you to lose to. How do you recover from that? Like, maybe they will. Like, maybe they will go 8-4 and four this year or whatever, 7-5. and five. But, like, you had the spotlight. You had an opportunity to not only crush a potential conference rival, but also to, like, sort of reclaim the narrative about your team after last year. And you fumbled it, man. And that was a big deal. So, yeah, man, I wanted Dion from jump. So, you know, people should tell me, yeah, I should be asking y'all, why weren't y'all believers? Yeah, Stefan, why didn't you believe? <laughs> That's one of my favorite answers in Hang Up and Listen History, I must say. And you know, Stefan, you know that Joel was affected by this because he hasn't even made fun of LSU yet. I mean, like, this that's this is serious. You know this is serious. If, like, he can't even get around to, to <laughs> drilling me for how horrible I feel like look. we would get to it, like, a little bit later in a second. We're yeah. going to. Um, <laughs> I think we'd have to go back and listen to some previous episodes of the show to see, to hear some of the other things that Joel said about Deion Sanders. Who has time uh, for that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't like him. I mean, we, I'll, I'll say I don't like him, but I want to win. So anyway. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and the narrative in the off season was this is kind of unethical and immoral, right? Telling all these football players to leave. Pack your bags, get the hell out of here. I don't want you. I'm bringing in my my guys. I'm bringing my luggage, and it's going to be Louie. This is what happens, right, Josh? It's that we our our short term memories are such that we will forget that there were 
ethical issues here because in the pantheon of college sports, all Deion Sanders is doing is what the system allows him to do right now. I mean, is this any different than what happened in college basketball with one and dones um, and the embrace of players leaving after one year? It's the exact same thing. And coaches who are late to this party are going to be left behind. Dabo Sweeney, for one. Um, and we'll get to him in a little bit. Um, and in terms of everything else, pretending that they're all underdogs when, in fact, Travis Hunter was like the number one recruit in his class and pretending that his son Shadur, the quarterback who threw for 510 yards on Saturday also wasn't overlooked and underappreciated football player. I mean, that's just Dion being bombastic Dion. Well, yes and no. I mean, he wasn't like a top recruit, but still he was going to follow his father wherever he went. Right. That's true. That's true. So all Dion Sanders has done here is take the tools that this, this flawed and corrupt system has given him and exploited them to the best of his abilities. It is kind of amazing that he could bring in 86 new players and in the course of three months, create a team that beat last year's runner up in the national championship game. It's remarkable. Yeah. Irrespective of whether it was the right thing to do or whether he went about it the right way. It's an unbelievable accomplishment. Like one of the more remarkable things that's been done in this sport um, in in our memory. And usually the nobody believed in us thing is not even based on a kernel of truth. In this case, they were huge underdogs. We had Matt Brown on here, a very smart guy, runs has a great newsletter, made a very convincing argument that him running off like all these offensive linemen was going to be death to them, at least in this first year. Like there are legitimate concerns that there were some tactical mistakes and how they went about doing this. Um, that, yeah, sure. The skill guys are going to be good. Um, there was all, there were also big question marks about Shadur. Like, I, I think he's not making that up. Like, mm-hmm. I think people just didn't know whether his style or his skills would translate to this level. And so when he says nobody believed in us, I think it's like actually more true than that statement generally is from coaches. But I think, Joel, getting back to the first thing you said, this game for him is, um, you can't imagine what it will do because he is a salesman, he's a preacher, and he's turned water into wine. Like what he's done in the last couple days is, like I said in the intro, just take a series of victory laps throwing it back in everyone's faces. People who legitimately doubted him, people like Ed Werder, who hasn't isn't actually a writer, so I don't even know what he was talking about. But what he is selling is himself. He sold himself to Travis Hunter, who is like a huge Deion Sanders fan growing up. Who but committed he's selling, to Florida State, and he talked him out of going there. But there's nothing that's more popular in the entire world than calling out the media. People love it. Players love it. Fans love it. Um, and... He can now, if there was a single living room he couldn't get into before, um, he can get into all of them now and he can say something that's true, which is people said I couldn't do it. I came to a 1-11 in school. I changed everything and I beat the team that was in the national championship game. And it's it's what Joel said. It's one of the most um, significant wins that I can remember. Yeah, I mean, you know, just imagine you're a 17-year-old four-star recruit in the DFW area, and you're watching that game, and you're watching everything that followed. Didn't that look fun? You know what I mean? Didn't it look cool? Now, nobody is thinking about, no, no, you know, uh, potential college athlete is thinking about, if it doesn't work out, he's going to run me off. Like, you don't think like that as a 17-year-old. You think, I'm going to go there, and I'm going to have success, and look at that dude. Look at what they're doing there. And, like, Dion in Colorado has something to sell. Like, how many other schools really, if you think about it, in this moment are going to be able to go into a house and do better than Dion with a kid? Like, Georgia, you've got, okay, Athens is a great college town. You've got Kirby Smart. He's building a bunch of dogs there. You know, like, that's a great program to play for. Alabama is an NFL finishing school. You know, USC has LA Cool or whatever. You can do that sort of thing. But, like, outside of a few of those schools, like... Wouldn't if you if you want to have a lot of fun and be in the national spotlight, 
it kind of seems like Colorado is a place where you can do that as well as anywhere else. And that's, I, I, the one, that, the that's one, an the, amazing thing to say, Joel. Six months ago, we were saying Boulder, Colorado yeah. is like the whitest campus in America. Yeah. It's in the mountains. It, right. You hike and you ski. This is right. not a place where black athletes go and feel comfortable. And now, but, after one game, to his credit, well, we're saying who wouldn't want to go to Colorado? Well, I would, the, what I'm saying is that who would want to go play for Dion? Yeah. The rejoinder, I say, all these colleges are white. You know what I mean? Like, so we get Colorado is white in, a, in its particular way. Colorado's but, pretty white in its own way. Colorado's pretty white. <laughs> but, like, it ain't like going to, uh, you know, Kentucky. You know, you're, you're going to necessarily feel like you're on a campus of your peers. I think the thing is, and, and, and people were wondering about why Dion was doubted. And there were reasons to doubt him for all the things that we just said here, you know. Um, it just seemed kind of, you know, running off all these people, bringing in not great linemen, whatever, like that's the thing. But I, I actually have another thing, and he sort of hinted at this after the game, talking about, you know, when you see a confident black man up here sitting here talking his talk, walking his walk, that's kind of threatening. I don't know that it was that, but I do think this is an important point. I don't think a lot of people, college fans, people that are involved in major college football take HBU's football seriously. Right. I don't think they think that they play football. And the the way that I know that is before Dion, the last HBCU coach to make the leap to FBS was a white guy named Jay Hobson. Right. And before that, it had happened like only once other time, one other time in the in, in the last four years or so. So people didn't have any respect for what he'd done at Jackson. I mean, you State. have high school, you have high school coaches who get hired to be college coaches straight out of yeah, high school. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And so like. He had all this success there, and people say, oh, well, he had better players than the other teams. Well, shit, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> that's like, that's part of college football. You're supposed to get better players. So, yeah, man, I um, I think that, you, you know, to kind of circle back on that, like, it was very consequential. You know, any Auburn could have had Dion. You know what I mean? Like, do you think Nick Saban would have rather, do you think Nick Saban was more afraid of Hugh Freeze, who beat him twice at Ole Miss, or would he have been more afraid of coaching against Dion? Yeah, do you, like, or Kirby Smart, do you think those guys wanted to coach against Dion? I don't think so. Well, I actually think, and I realize it more today than I did maybe last week or six months ago, that the fact that Colorado was so bad would have actually been a selling point to Dion. It was an empty mm -hmm. vessel right. that he could turn into a cult of personality for himself. And yeah, sure. I, I think there's a lot of criticism that you can make of him around like prime prep. There's been a lot of good journalism around how he turned that school into a cult of personality around himself. And um, there were a lot of negative consequences for a lot of people out of that. And I don't think he likes it when journalists actually investigate the things that he does and the things that he, that he says, and do, he does not invite that kind of scrutiny. But, you know, I think a lot of people, one of the things that I heard after the game was, all right, what school, where is he going to go next? Like, is Florida going to fire Billy Napier and try to hire him, like, this year? I don't know. Like, the, the thing that's going to be interesting to see is whether when Travis Hunter and Shadur leave, whether he then tries to go to Florida or some other school that's actually transcends him in some way, or whether what he wants to do is create a place that he controls he controls the media. He controls the athletic department. Players only come there because of him. And he can now make a legitimate argument that that works. He doesn't and have that, to win a national championship at Colorado. Let's be clear. If he goes nine and three, that is... That well, is, people were saying is, they were going to go, you know, four and eight, and it would be an right. improvement. But right. let's... I mean, let's and to, to your point, to your point, Josh, Dion will go somewhere where he is the, the, the center of attention. But... As you were saying, Joel, about his postgame comments about when you see a confident black man talking the talk and walking the walk, coaching 75% African Americans, that's kind of threatening. Um, does he have a point? He's not the first black college football coach, but as in the NFL, there is a paucity of black head right. coaches in FBS. 14 of the 133 bowl subdivision programs, 10.5% have black head coaches. Black Players That's more than I thought there were. That's an improvement. About half of FBS rosters. Well, the number went down, actually. Four black coaches were fired or resigned mm. after last season. Carl Durrell at Colorado, Herm Edwards at Arizona State, Willie Taggart at Florida Atlantic, David Shaw at Stanford. Only three were hired. Dion, 
Ryan Walters at Purdue and Kenny Burns at Kent State. Does Dion have, is there a Dion effect um, potentially? Or is Dion so much his own universe that it, it's really just about what he can control and not, he doesn't have the ability to change the, the landscape of college football? Yeah, I don't think you're going to see like Jackson State like maintain the level of winning that it had, for instance, right? And um, yeah, I, I don't think any black coach could be Dion or conduct himself like Dion, but I don't think any white coach could do what Dion does. Like Dion is one of one, and that's why you know that's what Bethune Cookman found out trying to hire Ed Reed. Like you just can't like you you can't just hire a f- famous former football player. And insert and think that that's going to be it. I mean, Eddie George is sort of like that proof. Like he's doing okay at Tennessee State, but he's not done what Dion did. But because nobody can do what Dion does. Like I mean, really, who's had, um, in terms of American sports stars, like in terms of charisma, like success across multiple, like who's had a better American sports career than Dion? Travis Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It'll guy, be interesting man. to see if that guy actually can keep it up playing both ways. We didn't mention that. There's no way. He cannot play 129 plays every Saturday. Like, that's impossible, right? There's also a question of whether it's irresponsible to have him play 129 yeah, plays. The number of exposures in a D1 college football game, yeah, that's insane. That's crazy. You know, they're going to be up 49 to nothing at half of all these games because they're so good. <laughs> um, Only no, if they but, play LSU, probably. But Right. So my two thoughts on that before we... And Florida State just beat down LSU in the second half, um, led by a quarterback, Jordan Travis, and wide receiver transfer, Keon Coleman, out of Michigan State. Um, their best defensive player, Jared Verse, is a transfer from Albany. And Mike Norvell has, like, it's kind of the opposite, right? Like, Travis Hunter wanted to go to Florida State because that's where Dion went. And then he just ended up following Dion everywhere. Like, in this game, neutral site Orlando, like I was, I sent this to you kind of as a, a joke, Joel, like remembering some FSU guys, like on the bench, they had Leroy Butler, Andre Wadsworth, Darnell Dockett, Brian McFadden, Travis Johnson, Peter Warwick, Snoop Menace. I mean, oh man, it, it's just I like a, di- games, it's, yeah. it's like a different kind of sales job. Right. And like Florida state, when we were growing up was the coolest school to go to. And it seems like they're like bringing it back. And this, I mean, maybe this is a kind of defense mechanism because by, you know, LSU getting beat down that much, I want to think that this is a really good team, but they looked really good. They have a bunch of really great players and Mike Norvell is like not Deion Sanders, but seems to have figured out something that, that can work at that program. Uh, yeah. I hadn't seen Florida state look that good since 2014, that the year that they, the year after they won the national championship and lost in the semifinals to Oregon with Jameis Winston. I didn't know a lot about either of these teams coming into them. Cause I didn't feel like there was a lot you could take from last year. Um, you know, LSU didn't finish great last year. Like they, they showed that they were good and they were better, but they were clearly not on the level of Georgia, right? The Georgia was, you know, that elite level was sort of beyond their grasp. And then you saw it again, you know, on Saturday. I'm like, oh, like Florida State's legit. The thing I don't know about LSU is if they're legit, right? Like we we read a lot into the Alabama win last year. Like how do you feel about the Brian Kelly era so far? Because I, I just like, you know, even like the Harold Perkins thing, I was like, oh, you know, in retrospect, Harold Perkins had one great game. I felt good about it until about like 7 p.m. Eastern on Sunday night. And I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> then they kind of got stuffed on fourth down in the first half, and then it was uh, a little bit downhill. No, like I, I think they were sh- they were really surprised. Like after the game, he says this is a total failure. Uh, Jaden Daniels, the quarterback, this is a great. Like if you were to think of hypothetical quotes that you wouldn't want your team starting quarterback <laughs> to say after week one. I would put this maybe at my number one spot in Family Feud. We thought it was going to be easy. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, all right, well, now this makes what? sense a little bit. Take it, Taken slightly out of context. But no, it seems like they thought, I mean, Brian Kelly said this too. We thought we were somebody else. We thought we were the two-time national champion Georgia Bulldogs or something. Um, and it's a contrast with Clemson just beats, gets the absolute snot beat out of them by Duke at Duke and like the Duke field rush was kind of objectively hilarious. But after the game, Dabo says like, oh yeah, you know, 
really bad. You know, it was a really weird game, but like, we're still good. Like, I really believe in us. We didn't play badly. Just like, you know, I don't know how you would approach it, Stefan, after your team loses by 21 points on opening weekend. Would you call it a total failure? To Duke. Or, to Duke, by to the Duke. way. Not, are you, are you more of a Brian Kelly, this is a total failure, we thought we were somebody else? <laughs> or are you more of a Dabo, uh, people are going to see the score and judge this football team, but I love this team and I see a lot of opportunity ahead. <laughs> I mean, Dabo's supporting his his guys, you know? He's out there taking one for him. But, I mean, what a... Schadenfreude is a sweet, sweet elixir. And you do love seeing this guy get his ass handed to him. In 2030, we're actually going to look back and Joel's going to be right, except it'll be transformative for Duke. Like, that's going to be the moment <laughs> from this weekend. They're going to be... I mean, to, to put a button on this, um, who would you rather have? You know, what would you rather have? The, the bombast of Deion Sanders or the sanctimony of Dabo Sweeney? I take Deion a million times out of a million. At least Deion, you got to have some fun. I'm still convinced the Deion thing is not going to end well in some form or, or fashion. Um, but, I mean, I would probably take Dabo's multiple national championships <laughs> <laughs> if I was a fan. I mean, Joel, you, you've said you care about winning. Um, and the Dion, you know, we've seen the Dion is good for Dion, that he's mm -hmm. created a huge amount of excitement. Um, but, you know, at the level that the top programs have won, I think that, you know, we have to wait and see on that. Yeah, we have to wait and see. I mean, I, look, I, yeah, I do want to win and I, I would like to win ethically if possible, but I know what it's the realities football, of FBS Joel. football. So yeah, I kind of know what that means. So yeah, I, I think Dion's going to do great. And, you know, I think TCU, man, I know some TCU fans listen to this. We really missed out, bro. Like, that was, we had opportunity to have a transformative moment for our program, and we're stuck with Sonny Dykes now. And, it, you know, there was, a, it was an ongoing joke here on this season last year about, oh, Joel doesn't believe in Sonny Dykes, blah, blah, blah. And people did that. And I felt like, again, I'm not a result, results guy. I'm a process guy. And I looked at that team, and I was like, eh, we'll see. So anyway, I hope you all, Joel, I hope you all the, enjoyed proving that. Proving the haters wrong, wrong again. You're like Dion, yeah. man. You got the receipts. I was a believer. And you're bringing I was them. a believer, Stefan. Yeah. <laughs> Up next, Michael Loxley's son was diagnosed with CTE posthumously, and he's continuing to coach football in Maryland. There is no I in team, but there is one in Indeed, and that's the hiring platform you need to build yours. When you're hiring, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring platform that can help you do it all. Indeed streamlines hiring with powerful tools that find you match candidates. With Instant Match, more than 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed Data US. Even better, Indeed's the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash hangup. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at indeed.com slash hangup. Just go to indeed.com slash hangup and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. Indeed.com slash hangup. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Researchers at Boston University reported last week that they had found evidence of the degenerative brain disease chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, in more than 40% of 152 young athletes who were exposed to repeated head impacts and died before turning 30. It's the biggest study yet on the brains of youth, high school, and college athletes, and it indicates that CTE can begin to develop at a young age. One of the athletes whose brain was examined by the BU scientists was Miko Loxley, a former college football player who was shot and killed in 2017 after years of declining mental health. And while every story about CTE is tragic, Miko Loxley's is especially powerful because of what his father does for a living. He's the head coach of the University of Maryland football team. 
Pulitzer Prize winning reporter John Branch of the New York Times talked to Michael Loxley and his wife Kia for a piece published last week timed to the release of the BU study. Here's the coach speaking to the Times in a video accompanying Branch's story. Does it hurt that I lost my son? 100% it does. But I also will tell you truthfully that the game also gives a lot. Josh, the headline on Branch's story is, After the loss of a son, a football coach confronts a terrible truth. And boy, is that putting it mildly. We've seen a lot of stories about CT and the tragedy that follows a life in football. And there are a bunch that stand out. I remember reading Andre Waters' story and Junior Seau's story. But this one hit me in a way that none of the other ones had um, for all the reasons that you cited in your introduction, Stefan. And, you know, Joel, it's not lost on me that we just talked about Deion Sanders' son, Shador, and his just outstanding performance and Colorado's opening win. And a lot of, you know, the conversation was Deion talking about, I'm a father and I'm a coach. And from, you know, I've, I'm so proud of my son and I knew that he could do it. And I've been following him and watching him play since he was just a little kid. Um, and there's something kind of meaningful and powerful. Like, I, I think we always like to hear stories about um, fathers and sons or fathers and daughters or mothers and sons, mothers and sons, whatever, in sports, that there is something deep and meaningful and powerful there. Um, but there's this kind of hypothetical that often gets asked um, and it is off, so often a hypothetical. Like I remember Barack Obama being asked, if you had a son, would you allow him to play football? And it's often just asked, and I'm, maybe you've been asked, Joel, or maybe you thought about it, but it, it's often asked in this just sort of hypothetical and theoretical sort of way, which makes it just a little bit cold and bloodless. And in this case, I've never seen that question asked so starkly and directly and meaningfully mm. in a way where... It's a literal life and death question, not like a theoretical kind of trolley problem sort of question. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I can't ever remember somebody in his position having to face a question like that. And um, I thought the answer was revealing because I think if you are involved in the game long enough, you come to understand that football never gives back what it takes. And that's even if you make it out with your tendons and like your senses intact, right? Um, and by the time you realize you're in something very dangerous and that maybe the sacrifices you've made for the game are not worth it, you're probably in too deep. You know, the game is fun, maybe up through high school. And I'm, I'm, I don't think, I don't want to speak universally for football players, but I think that, you know, being around enough of them, I feel like this is true. The game is fun through high school, and it's part of a bond that I share with my father. My father played college football. We went to high school games, college games. My dad comes out here. We'll go to a high school game. It's like the thing that we share the most that brings us together, right? Um, and my father gave the love of the game to me. And so, but then you get to college and you're like, oh man, I was surprised at how many people actually hated football, how many players that did not want to be out there. And then you see people whose dreams and well short of the wealth, or they're limping through retirement and with not as much money as expected. And, and, and then, but then you're on scholarship and you need money to stay in school. It's a very coercive set of circumstances. Everything is pushing you forward and to not think about when you're 38 years old or 42 years old or 24 and dealing with like mental health issues. So yeah, man, I mean, Mike Loxley has his dream job and yes, he lost his son, but football has made him wealthy, prominent, influential in ways that not many black men can be in this country doing anything else. So it's understandable how he'd look at the loss of Miko and say, that was unfortunate, but that was a lightning strike. I don't have to demonize football. Um, just because my son died. I don't know how you could go on if you didn't try to justify or rationalize mm -hmm. um, all of it. I mean, how could you walk onto a practice field and look at these hundred students, athletes, um, and not think about how every one of them is potentially your son and every one of them could go through what your son went through? I don't think there's any way to do that 
um, and maintain your sense of self and your sense of job without understanding or, or believing deeply that the sport does offer these things opportunity to them and to you. He's very upfront in John Branch's story about how football has been great to him. It's given him this life of privilege, of wealth. The emotional swings that he and his wife and the rest of his family must go through on a daily basis on Saturday afternoons. I mean, I just cannot, I cannot fathom it, Josh. It just feels so overwhelming to be come now and willingly too. I mean, credit to Mike Loxley, right? For being willing to talk about his son and what happened to him and the, po the posthumous diagnosis of CTE. It was Mike Loxley's idea to donate his son's brain to the BU researchers, to their CTE uh, organization. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Credit to him for his candor and his willingness to go to these really dark places. And there's just so much tension, internal tension and conflict here. And one of the more interesting kind of points is, you know, I think John Branch asked him about the sort of innovations in the Ivy League around no contact practices and things like that. And he said, I don't want to, I couldn't go there. Like, I'm not willing to do that because I'm judged on Saturdays based on wins and, and losses. And that to me was fascinating. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not like as steeped in literature as perhaps I would like to be. So I have to give credit. I used my phone, a sibling card. So thank you, Lauren, for this. I did have the sense when I was reading this, that there's just something like biblical and mythological in the story. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. the binding of, of Isaac and, you know, God ordering Abraham to sacrifice his son or like the victims of the Minotaur and like the people of Athens sending young citizens to, um, you know, go into this labyrinth and get killed by this monster. I mean, it feels a little bit kind of ridiculous or over the top to make those kinds of comparisons. But there is something to me that just feels really deep and profound about this of like, you know, a father sacrificing a son to this sport that is worshipped in households and in this in this country, and then not being able or willing to to give it up. Like, I, I think there's no story that struck me um, as deeply about the kind of hold that football has on our society. And we should say, like, there's no proof that CTE has any kind of um, particular effect on any individual person. Like, you know, and men can develop schizophrenia in this kind of age range. Like we can't say definitively that anything happened in, but we've, you know, seen enough in terms of, um, you know, studies and Stefan cited one in the, in the beginning that it seems like it would be naive, you know, blinkered to, to, you know, ignore the, the possibility. But, you know, Joel, my, my mind just like kept going to these really kind of like <laughs> deep thoughts about, you know, football and family and life. Um, and the story just kind of drag, dragged out of me. Reading it, you know, uh, I did find Mike Lotsley's answer um, about, you know, maybe considering no contact in practice really instructive because old football practices went out until someone you respect proves you can win another way, right? And so I don't think he has any respect for, like, Ivy League football um, in that way. Not, you know what I mean, but just that, like, ah, eh, well, they, they could do that over there at Dartmouth, but that doesn't have anything to do with what I'm doing in the Big Ten. And, and also the, the, the talk about Little League football, because, man, I mean, I played Little League football. Like, nobody talked. And I remember players getting concussions, like kids, you know, when we were playing, you know, having to miss a, a practice or something because of a concussion. And you, it's like you're reading about this this time. Like, you know that this is going to change. Like, we know that the game is going to evolve past even Mike Loxley in this way. But it's just sort of interesting to see somebody that's in the moment, that's dealing with the greatest loss that you could ever possibly have. And he's just having to sit here in this moment and lay himself out there for people. I actually thought, you know, they asked him how he felt. And he didn't really answer how he felt. Yeah. He said, well, my kid, my grandsons are playing football. He didn't say how he felt. Like, I think... 
like saying you're hurt doesn't really, I don't think covers it. And his wife was probably more evocative and more vulnerable. And they're still together. I mean, this is the kind of thing that can tear marriages apart. And it seems like they're not in exactly the same place either. Like, No, not at all. She seems yeah. way more willing to, you know, to have, you know, changes in the sport. But like, she's still the coach's wife. They still have the thing on the wall that's like, you know, the list of all the stops, the 11 stops that they've made in their she, life. She's the football. one that said that she didn't, she's the one that said it doesn't make sense for kids that young to be playing she football. Did, and yeah. he's the one that said, I have grandsons I love now that are playing contact football before high school. So yeah, like this isn't, I didn't get the sense that they had resolved this. Um, no. But I don't want to, you know, read too much into it. No, and, yeah. and their son Miko started playing at age seven, right? Um, and mm-hmm. Kia Loxley, uh, Mike Loxley's wife, says they were seven and weighed nothing and the hits, it almost looked like they just bounced off each other. And now she's haunted by her carefree attitude, John Branch writes. She remembered and she recalled the time that he was knocked out in middle school. And they just kind of blew it off. Like, oh, he's oh, he's walking, he's talking, he looks okay. Um, and she says, you know, she feels guilt over how they approached football. Um, you know, then he's got grandsons that play. They've got a son that plays in the Canadian Football League. Yeah. And when Miko started to decline, it seems like they didn't, they either didn't put it together, even though they had his brain scanned with, and there were hot spots in the the brain. I mean, you can't mm-hmm. diagnose CT and uh, on a, a living person at this stage. But it just seems like they must have thought about it consciously, not just subconsciously. Because Mike Loxley decided after he died right away to get his brain tested. And Mike Loxley says that yeah, he well, he saw the movie Concussion in 2015. And that and also he wanted to rule out drugs. Yeah. He also wanted to rule out drugs. That seemed like it was really important to him that it wasn't drugs. Right. It, it feels like Mike Loxley wants to believe that this was unpredictable, unpreventable mental illness. That would be the, the safest, most convenient answer. But, but it also seems like he, he kind of takes the NFL line on this, which is that we can make the game safer by eliminating big hits um, you know, the targeting, things like, I mean, I'm reading into it a little bit, Joel, but it seems yeah. like he feels like progress mm-hmm. is being made. And there's more, it's true, there is more awareness of concussions. And it feels like he thinks that's a good thing. And that like, that's the kind of changes to football that he supports. Yeah, that if he's, oh, if he's pays attention to his players and how they're behaving and what they're feeling and makes it clear to them that they should come and talk to him if they're feeling any sort of mental health problem or any physical problem from a hit, then that's enough. I mean, what goes unanswered, Joel, with the, the, the reference to the Ivy League and reducing hitting is that, yeah, that can be a competitive disadvantage if you do it on your own. But if you lobby for the entire sport to change, right. then you create an equal playing field that helps to protect everybody. Yeah, I, I guess I was trying to sit here and think about, like, what do we want Mike Loxley to do? What do we want us to do from, like, going over these stories, right? Because we're not going to stop watching football. We, you know, um, we you just know, talked we're not going to stop playing minutes. football. Yeah. And I just, so I, I, we, we put Mike Loxley in a real uncomfortable position, like maybe an unfair one in some ways, right? That, um, because, yeah, he's not, there's, <laughs> how could he change? Like, what, I mean, what is he, what is he going to do? I mean, I assume he's made enough money to retire, but I don't I don't believe he's at retirement age. So what do we want us to do as a result of this? And I'm not saying that we have to answer a question or anything or anything right now, but, you know, uh, I'm glad that John Branch wrote this story. We, don't, we didn't learn anything different about the game through this story that we didn't already know. And so I guess the issue is like, what are we going to do about it? And I, like, we're not going to answer it much better than Mike Loxley, right? Coming up next, we'll talk to ESPN's Elizabeth Merrill about the phenomenon that is Nebraska women's volleyball. At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you earned doubled. 
All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned to snowboard also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope, Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check out for yourself at discover.com slash match. This episode is brought to you by SAP. Welcome to the window, the window of opportunity. When your next move can either make your business famous or obsolete. So you need to be ready. Be handling good surprises and bad ones ready. Be opening a Portland, Houston, and Providence location on the same day ready. Be stock options plus paid family leave ready. SAP has been there and can help you be ready for anything that happens next. Because it will. Be ready with SAP. Last week in Lincoln, Nebraska, more than 92,000 fans packed into the University of Nebraska's Memorial Stadium went wild when the home team emerged from the tunnel through a smoke machine. Let's listen. That raucous intro was not for Nebraska's football team, which went 4-8 and eight last year and opened this season with a 13-10 loss at Minnesota. No, these Cornhuskers were the women's volleyball team, which is a much tougher ticket in the state these days. Joining us now is ESPN senior writer Elizabeth Merrill, who wrote a fantastic piece about how Nebraska plotted to break a record for attendance at a women's sporting event and how the school has made volleyball a state wide phenomenon. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Elizabeth, you actually covered the volleyball team in the early 2000s as a beat reporter for the Omaha World Herald. Filling Memorial Stadium might seem like a one-time stunt, but as your story explains, it's not. Nebraska volleyball has been building towards something absurd like this for a long time. It has. Um, Every venue they've played in, every home venue, It's always been hard to to get a seat there, whether it was the Nebraska Coliseum back from, you know, the mid 90s until 2013. They seated 4000 and and there was a desire to bump that up just because they are so wildly successful. So they moved to an 8000 seat arena. And, you know, one of the thought besides the fact that the basketball team was leaving the Bob Devaney Center and someone needed to occupy that spot. There is There are generations of volleyball fans that have never gotten to see them play simply because there's not enough tickets to do it. So can you just, for, for people that didn't get to read your great story, talk about what it is that makes Nebraska this volleyball mad? Because um, it, it seems like, I mean, as you might expect, Football played a role in that, but yeah, what what makes it so unique uh, compared to its neighbors and, and other conference mates in this way? Well, Nebraska volleyball has been successful in part because of football success. Uh, back in the 80s and 90s when the football team was doing so well, Nebraska became sort of a leader in pumping resources and time into their women's athletics. They were fortunate enough to have a coach named Terry Pettit, who was sort of a visionary, who really cultivated a love for the sport within the state, just going grassroots, going to these small towns in Nebraska, even if they only had like 10 kids at one of their clinics. He went there because you never know, someday you might find that kid who is going to be the diamond in the rough. Um, They found that, by the way, in this tiny town called Hooper, Nebraska, Jordan Larson became not only an All-American at Nebraska, not only uh, someone who led them to the national championship, but she uh, was an Olympic MVP and actually led them to their first gold medal, the United States' first gold medal. So I think it's just as little boys kind of grew up wanting to play Nebraska football, I think that's changed a little bit now. I mean, they're they're picking other spots to play now. Uh, and the whole college football landscape has changed for that matter. But little girls, Terry Pettit sort of cultivated this attitude that uh, if, if you're a kid and you're an athlete in Nebraska, you want to play for the volleyball team. And that has not changed. Um, 
that volleyball is such a big sport in the state that it, in some ways, people joke about this, that it's become a volleyball state instead of a football state. Now, I think that probably is a, going a little bit overboard, but it's definitely something in that, you know, a kid might go to a match maybe seven, eight, nine years old, and and that seed is planted. Because back then in the 90s especially, you didn't attend a lot of women's events where the the crowd was so engaged. Um, and by the way, that the place that they played back then, the Nebraska Coliseum, it was such a unique venue. It was like basically fit for volleyball, which is pretty rare. So you had all these kids in this arena, like hearing these, this deafening sort of roar of the crowd. And they didn't see that a lot. When, when you were a little girl, you didn't, in the nineties, you didn't see that a lot for women's events. Sure. You saw it with football, but those tickets were just equally as hard to get back then too. There's waiting lists for season tickets for football. Now there is for volleyball. Yeah. It's funny. Like the success of football, I think helped seed this as you explained. And then the total like crash and decline of football probably helped cement um, volleyball as a sport that not only was popular, but was something that people across the state could be proud of um, and something that, um, you know, everybody loves a winner, right? And what I think this shows, as well as, you know, the Barcelona, you know, match in, in European soccer that got over 90,000 people. Um, Twice. Yeah, twice. um, That there is something to be said about aiming high and going big and trying to do um, huge things and get huge crowds in in women's sports. Because what we've gotten used to is resource scarcity as smaller locker rooms, having a weight room, just have like two barbells. I mean, it, it just shows, Elizabeth, kind of what is possible if you don't put a kind of artificial ceiling on things and actually try to do something huge. For sure. And I, you know, I was actually born and raised in Nebraska. So I have a, I mean, I have my own memories as a kid, wherever you went, um, the games on Saturdays in the fall were like the soundtrack of your life, basically. You went into the store they were playing. I mean, I mean, the state sort of stopped. And I know there's an argument when all this came about, not that I like completely go on Twitter and try to follow everyone's reactions or anything like that, or X, I guess. But um, there were a lot of people who would say, well, there's nothing else to do in Nebraska. Well, I mean... Omaha's metropolitan area is 750,000. There are other things to do, but I do think what holds true in Nebraska is football was their identity. I mean, it is a small enough state that like a sport can kind of become your identity. And when that was gone, people just want to follow a winner. And the women's team, the volleyball team provided that. And I think that's why you've got such a passion. And as well with this event, a lot could have gone wrong. They pumped a lot of resources into this event. Um, and if it rained or if it was super windy, everything sort of would have fallen by the wayside. But I, I, I'm not... Would they have just canceled the game? Well, yeah. You know what they were going to do is they were going to have to move it inside. And obviously that would have only accommodated like 8,000 people. I believe that was their plan B. And, you know... So all of Nebraska's population is basically in this 40, most of Nebraska's population is in this like 50 mile radius, Omaha and Lincoln, which is the university. And there are people who come from seven hours away in outstate Nebraska and the panhandle who came for this thing. There were buses of like volleyball teams who would never get to see something like this. So you would have had like 85,000 people who would have kind of been... who would have traveled all that way for nothing. Would have been a different story, Stefan. Ne- yeah. Enraged Nebraskans burn football stadium to ground. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's so fascinating. You know, on the one hand, it starts as, hey, let's set a record and try to get everybody on board. Let's beat Wisconsin's record of 18,000 or whatever it was for the previous volleyball record. And then it morphs into something much larger, Elizabeth. And and I think what we're, we're seeing here in Nebraska and the way volleyball has become sort of the de facto 
women's sport of choice and and the sort of one and one a in sports in the state we see this replicated with women's sports across college um, athletics. You think of North Carolina and soccer and Oklahoma and softball and UConn and basketball. These are states that don't necessarily have gigantic pro sports identities, and they find ways to create something um, out of women's sports that people constantly said couldn't be successful, couldn't be successful. Utah and gymnastics. There you go. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if if you see Oklahoma, their softball team, trying to go into the football stadium yep. and, and see what kind of crowds they can get. And, you know, a lot of that is, uh, you know, uh, we want to one up the other. We want to be like number one. But you're right. I, I can't, you know, when I did cover Nebraska volleyball, gosh, it was more than 20 years ago now, I would have never seen anything like this. I mean, you know, I also, because you know, if you cover one sport, uh, you often cover some of the other like Olympic sports or whatever. But like, I remember covering women's basketball and they were, and they had a coach that was very fr fan friendly and they would get like six or 7,000 people sometimes, but it was through ticket giveaways. I think that's, and I think that's another thing that people assume is that this was, that people were given free tickets to this. Well, they weren't. I mean, these were $25 a ticket. I think, you know, for kids, they were five, but still the act of bringing all these people together. I know it's not like paying like $400, which is what the Nebraska Colorado <laughs> tickets are going for this week for football. But it is the act of actually plunking now money and coming from all over different, different parts. I mean, there are people from different states who came just because they wanted to be part of this. And it's true, right, that Nebraska's volleyball team is, is the highest revenue generating women's sport in NCAA. That's correct, right? Well, my colleague Paula Levine and I, she, uh, the, the, through the Power Five ones, yes. And I think some of that, you know, uh, one of our editors wanted us to look at the UConn women's basketball program because you can't think, you know, when you guys think, when I think of something, uh, a, a women's program that is held in such high regard, I'd have, you'd have to think UConn women. Well, they don't make money. They lose money. And I think part of that goes, you know, basketball is, it, it, they, they actually make more in ticket revenue, I think, than Nebraska does. But the problem is they also play, pay their coach a lot more, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, and they pay their staff a lot more. And they probably travel a lot more for recruiting. I mean, Gino is going to living rooms throughout the country for people, whereas Nebraska, I mean, they, I would say, yes, they definitely have their, um, their in-state kids, but yeah, it, it, so there's, there's a difference there. It costs more, I guess, to do business in women's basketball, but yes, they do. Uh, and that was one thing that John Cook, their coach, who's led them to four national championships at Nebraska said, you know, when he first started, he went to this football booster, uh, luncheon called the beef club. And basically they were saying, we pay for your trips, you know, and John Cook took that personally. And he made, he made a point to, that someday that, that his program was going to be a revenue producer. And sure enough, that's what they are right now. Is he the guy that told you when you told him that you were leaving the volleyball beat to cover football? Do you think that's a promotion? Yeah. He said, is that, he said, is that a demotion? He looked at me and he <laughs> said, I said, Hey John, I'm not going to be covering you guys anymore. I'm covering Nebraska football full time. And that was back in like 2001. I mean, they made it to the national championship game that year, albeit it was not a, it was a very lopsided game. And yeah, he looked at me and said, is that a demotion? And I, I would have to think he was kind of kidding, but like, <laughs> this is a guy who his, his big motto is dream big. And he thinks big and he doesn't like he loves football. He knows its place. I mean, football uh, obviously provides a lot of revenue and it makes Nebraska one of like, I think only like Paula would know this better, but 20 some schools throughout college athletics who, you know, pay their own bills throughout, you know, throughout the athletic department and don't need like public funding or anything. But at the same time, he always dreamed big. He always thought that his program shouldn't take a back seat, that they shouldn't just automatically think that, hey, you know, we're, we're beholden to everyone else and we're kind of like, you know, the B team or something like that. He's, he's always kind of believed they belonged on that stage. So um, 
there's one way to frame this that it's a gimmick. And we've seen things like this, like the Winter Classic with NHL has been successful in playing in football and baseball stadiums. You've had college basketball games on air, aircraft car carriers. And there's a kind of curiosity factor there. And also there's not just the com competition on the volleyball court. There's this like weird uh, intrastate thing with Wisconsin. Like we want to just demolish the Wisconsin <laughs> attendance record that maybe played some small part in it. But I would actually argue that compared to all of that other stuff, that there's something like deeply meaningful about this moment in a bunch of different ways. Um, for one thing, you mentioned what it was like, you know, as a girl growing up in Nebraska, seeing, um, you know, games with raucous crowds of, of 8,000, seeing these amazing women play a sport. I mean, can you imagine the message that it sends to everyone in the state, not just girls and women, that like you said, people are willing to pay 92,000 people come from all over the state to see women play a sport. I mean, that's like pretty huge and deep. And I can imagine that just having an impact on people in ways they probably don't even understand um, to, at, at this point. But also just, you know, whether it's, you know, in Spain or at the Women's World Cup or cricket, there is a huge crowd for a game. Just the message that that sends, not only as a social message, but as a commercial one around what can happen if you value women and women's sports, that it's not just a social good, that actually that these women are under, just from a capitalistic perspective, that um, they're not exploited <laughs> enough in our like capitalist society, that you can make a lot of money off of uh, women's sports. And that, that's that's a sort of a growing realization with all of these things. It's like FIFA mm -hmm. saying, oh, who knew? We could, <laughs> we could sell the rights for the World Cup for the Women's World Cup for more money or we'll sell out every ticket. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, Nebraska's athletic director is a former Nebraska football star, Trev Alberts. And he's quoted in uh, one of the ESPN stories saying there's a great business case and strategy around women's athletics long term that maybe college athletics hasn't embraced. Um, it seems like that's a that there's this progressive understanding about not just the social value, but the economic value going on there. Yeah, Trev told me that like the week before the match, he thinks that there's this growth potential that like is sort of untapped. Now, does that mean they're gonna have all their matches at Memorial Stadium? No, but you know, Trev, Trev played football at Nebraska when the volleyball team was really on the rise. He went to some matches. He sees uh, how significant this moment is, and really, it's going to help. Can you imagine being a softball player or a gym or a gymnast? I mean, everybody saw this and what happened at, at Nebraska. I mean, I think this is going to be good recruiting uh, potential for like every women's program uh, at Nebraska. People are going to want to go there. But you're right. I mean, we saw it with the NCAA tournament, women's basketball tournament, um, and, and how many people. Uh, were, like watch the LSU Iowa game. I, I do think that this is an untapped. Uh, I agree with Trev. It's like this is an untapped market that is just going to get bigger. Well, Nebraska just landed like the best softball player in the country, Jordy Ball, on a transfer from Oklahoma. So maybe Nebraska softball is the next um, the next big revenue generator. Maybe. And she was from Nebraska originally, right. and Nebraska could not get her to come to... Uh, of course, you know, would you at that point, uh, you know, are you going to play for like a, this powerhouse or a team that's, you know, trying to get back to prominence? But what, that was the interesting thing that Jordy Ball said, too, is like she wanted to go home. She wanted to forge her own path and sort of build up her home state. Um, and so, yeah, for women's athletics in the state of Nebraska, it has been a very monumental couple of months in the state, for sure. Joel, Nebraska volleyball is coming out to the Bay. Yes, I'm going to go. September 12th against Stanford, uh, another one of the great volleyball programs. I'm a big volleyball fan. Maybe not a lot of people knew that. I covered volleyball uh, before I worked at BuzzFeed a little bit. So yeah, man, I can't wait to see him. When you went from covering football to volleyball, was that a promotion or a demotion? <laughs> <laughs> I will say, uh, I didn't cover anybody in football as good as I covered somebody in volleyball that year. The, the, the volleyball star I covered that year ended up playing at Stanford. Uh, so yeah, it was 
Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it is a demotion because it is still Florida high school football. But, you know, they're about, it was about equivalent. I had a good time. Well, yeah, that's they're a lot more accessible, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's like it's easier to get. Although with Nebraska, it's getting harder and harder. I think anytime you... <laughs> Uh, yeah, anytime you cover something that's like super successful. But yeah, that was always the thing I like that was refreshing about women's athletics is you can sure talk to the athletes a lot uh, easier and quicker. Elizabeth, if you can mention this to, to Trev, my idea is Jordy Ball, do a home and home with Oklahoma, put them both in football stadiums and have there be a competition of which state can draw more people. Oh, like, I think a lot of people probably couldn't see, you know, just with the way the court was set up. But I wonder how that would work for softball. All right, fine. 60,000, you know, just limit it, limit it. 70,000. No, that's no, it's a good one. I, like, I, I think it might be better to see something like that than than volleyball. Well, I, I don't yeah. know how that works. Anyway, no, I will. If I talk to him again, <laughs> I definitely will. Elizabeth Merrill is a senior writer at ESPN. We'll post a link to her story about Nebraska volleyball. Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming on the show with us. Thanks for having me. Apple Card is the perfect credit card for every purchase. It has cash back rewards unlike others. You earn unlimited daily cash back on every purchase, receive it daily, and can grow it at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone and start earning and growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. And now it is time for After Balls, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says, and I quote, it was okay. In our segment on Nebraska volleyball, we didn't mention that the 92,000 fans at Lincoln Stadium has been referenced pretty much everywhere as a world record for a women's sporting event. Actually, it wasn't. In 1971, the opening match and the final of the Women's World Cup soccer tournament in Mexico drew more fans. The tournament, though, was unofficial because the men running FIFA and UEFA, soccer's European governing body, like most sportocrats the world over, believed that women shouldn't play sports. Instead, the event was organized by a private group that had backed an Italian women's league, the Federation of Independent European Female Football, which believed that women should play soccer, but mostly, as we'll see, so that men could objectify them. The FIEFF was sponsored by the liquor company Martini and Rossi. Childhood TV ad memory? Martini and Rossi on the rocks say yes. It ran its first tournament in Italy in 1969 with four European teams. Italy beat Denmark in the final. England beat France in the third place game. A year later, seven teams participated and the group called the tournament the Women's World Cup. This time, Denmark won, beating Italy 2-0 in Turin in front of around 40,000 spectators. Then came the 1971 tournament in Mexico, run by the same group. Martini and Rossi paid travel, lodging, and uniform expenses for all six teams that qualified or were admitted. Mexico, Argentina, and England in one group, Italy, France, and Denmark in the other. Stadiums in Mexico City and Guadalajara were ringed with advertiser dasher boards, Alka-Seltzer, Bacardi Rum, a tea company, a steel maker, and there was a tournament mascot. So Cheetel, a cartoon native girl with pigtails and an hourglass figure wearing a Mexico kit and holding a ball. Goalposts were painted pink and white. The New York Times published a United Press International story before the tournament headlined Soccer Goes Sexy South of the Border. The story quoted the head of the organizing committee saying of the event, It's a natural, the combination of the two passions of most men around the world, soccer and women. 
Opposition to women playing soccer was, of course, pervasive. European teams that qualified were forced to drop out. Argentina's South American opponents in qualifying were no-shows. England warned players not to participate. And members of the team, which included a 13, a 14, and a 15-year-old, were banned by the FA after returning to the country. A reported 100,000 people attended the opener at Azteca Stadium, a 3-1 to win for Mexico over Argentina. 80,000 went to a Mexico-England match. And then came the final between Denmark and Mexico on this very day, September 5th, 1971. The crowd has been reported variously as 110,000 or 112,500 people. Denmark won 3-0 on a hat-trick by 15-year-old Suzanne Augustuson. There's a minute and a half of video on YouTube of Augustuson's three goals. You'll see a sweet back heel pass, a nutmeg, a tough tackle, a threaded through ball, a shot from an impossible angle, and some atrocious defending and goalkeeping. We'll post a link to the video on our show page. Suzanne Augustuson would have a long career as a professional football player in Italy, where she played for more than two decades and scored more than 600 goals. Denmark's soccer association didn't recognize its team's World Cup wins, and Augustuson was never called up after the official national team was formed in 1972. Before I ask you what your Suzanne Augustuson is, Josh, I want to note that a new documentary about the 1971 World Cup is out this week. It's titled Copa 71. Serena and Venus Williams and Alex Morgan are listed as executive producers. The directors of the doc, Rachel Ramsey and James Erskine, unearthed archival footage and tracked down women who played in the tournament. Copa 71 premieres on Thursday at the Toronto Film Festival, and I am looking forward forward to checking it out. All right, Josh, what's your Suzanne Augustuson? All right, I hope you've had a chance to listen to the first episode of the new season of One Year on 1955. It's about the Cannon Street All-Stars, an all-black Little League team that challenged America's white supremacist culture. I'm not going to tell the full story here in case folks haven't heard it yet, but I will say that it's alternately uplifting and depressing. And I found it incredibly powerful to hear The three men we interviewed who played on that team reflect back on what that experience meant to them nearly 70 years later. As Joel knows, we do really in-depth interviews to make these episodes, and a lot of stuff doesn't make it into the final cut. And because all these guys are such great storytellers, I wanted to give you a little bit more here from those conversations. Um, First up, Leroy Major. Uh, He was the star pitcher on the team. Stefan, you noted last week that a big key to Little League success is having a kid who's bigger than everyone else. Well, Leroy, in addition to being very skilled, was about six feet tall when he was 12 years old. And he was so tall, in fact, that the coaches at the Cannon Street Little League wanted to be absolutely sure that he was eligible to play. How old are you? He said 12. You shall? Yes, sir. No, well, we need your birth certificate. So I had to go home and bring my birth certificate back so they could verify that I was 12 years old. And just to be clear, like this is in the all black Little League. These are like the black coaches who are like, are you sure that you're you're 12 years old? Because um, when we were talking about this, uh, you know, you potentially using this in the story, you're like, there was some point of confusion because the entire story is like inflected by racism and like white supremacist attitudes towards like black people and black children. But like this was not one of the many cases of like the white people questioning. This was like the black people being like, are you sure that you're 12 years old? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next up, I've got a clip from Buck Godfrey. And I've got to say, if you've heard the episode, you're probably like me. I just love this guy's voice. It's just an amazing voice. This is the guy, Joel, who is a like in the Georgia Hall of Fame as a high school football coach. Um, And this doesn't really need any setup because you'll hear me asking the question. Here we go. Can you give me the scouting report on Buck Godfrey as a 12-year-old? He's a line drive hitter, (laughs) patient at the plate. He's probably going to wait for his pitch. Best pitch to get him out at that time was high inside. Anything below that, he's going to hit it. As a fielder, if you get a single, don't try to get second base because he's going to throw you out. 
If it's a double, don't stretch it into a triple because you're going to throw you out at third. <laughs> it's a pretty decent ball player. <laughs> I He had that... I love that. He had that just that. queued up. Like, there was no pause when I asked him. It just started going into it. Just the level of detail. It's like he'd been asked that question before, right? <laughs> but just the level of detail from 68 years ago or whatever and specificity. I really, really love that uh, tape. All right, finally, here's John Rivers. And this last clip gets at something I found really important. So let's roll it and then we can discuss. You didn't think about the fact that the odds of getting to the major leagues was just um, so narrow that uh, you should give up on your thoughts about it. To imagine yourself being on the field and playing baseball, it was an escape. And because while you were playing ball, you, you were completely in the zone. You're out of all the craziness around you and potential danger because we were in Charleston, South Carolina, and there were, there were threats, you know, racial threats all around. So two things there. Number one, I just think it really evokes this moment in American history where baseball for Black Americans was just such a profound kind of cultural thing, like the place where you would look for Black achievement and success and, and possibility, which helps explain the popularity of, of the sport, but also just the sense that for these kids, baseball was like, yeah, this venue to like dream and think of possibilities but also just like a, an escape, like a place where they would feel safe. And that's just kind of the sadness of the story, which I think is a little bit more implicit in the actual piece than in what, what John Rivers just said. But, you know, these, these white people, whether it's the Little League officials or, you know, people in South Carolina, took this thing that was their like one safe place and their one venue to really think about the possibility of a different world and just like kind of wrecked it. You know, and just like showed them that actually we can get you anywhere. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just sort of interesting. I've been thinking a lot about aging um, a lot this summer uh, for whatever reason. Well, there are reasons, but and you always just sort of wonder, um, like, what are the things you're going to remember? at the, Like, what do people remember at the end of their life? Like my wife's grandmother, who almost made it to 100, like she remembered dancing on a boat like with a friend when she was like 60 years old or something like that. And you're just like, well, what are the things that you're going to remember at the end of your life? So it was like beautiful to hear Buck Godfrey talk, give you that scouting report. But also it reminds you like, oh, like some of the pain, like some of the trauma um, from those times are going to stick with you forever too. Um, that Like that stuff you can't run away from. You know, even something as magical, as beautiful as like Little League Baseball can be spoiled by racism. Like that's just something that America is great at. Like we can, we can ruin anything um, with anti-black racism in this country and it will infect and stay with kids forever. So it's just something to think about as we move forward in this world, right? That, you know, the things that you're doing to kids today, you know, they may live forever and never forget it, man. That is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. To listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out, go to slate.com slash hangup and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Joel Anderson and Stefan Fatsis, I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zelmo Beatty, and thanks for listening. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids, and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No.